example, killed someone deliberately, I'm setting him free. It's not your right. It's the right of the family of the victim, of the deceased. You have no right. No one has right to say he's not to be killed or executed. If you do this, then you have opposed Allah's command. You've crossed the line. No one can say that this person robbed, and he robbed before. Instead of chopping his hand, we will chop his two hands or even his legs as well. This is not acceptable by a man to say. If a person who had never married in his life, but he's a playboy, he keeps on fornicating and we catch him and we flog him. We did this six, seven times. And at the end, the Imam says, well, because people are doing it, we're going to raise the bar a little bit. Whoever fornicates, we will punish him by flogging him 100 lashes and we will take all of his money, all of his property. This is not up to you because this is from Allah. And Allah drew the lines. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala drew the lines and he told us not to cross it. So no one can come and say, yeah, I would add this extra. Which brings us to the prescribed punishment for drinking wine, intoxicants. Is it prescribed punishment or is it just a punishment from Allah without specifying it to a certain number of lashes? It's an issue of dispute. And the most authentic opinion is that there isn't any specific number of lashes. 40 was what the Prophet ﷺ suggested, you may say. And 80 is what Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, raised it when the people did not pay attention to the prohibition of wine and they kept on drinking and being lashed or being flogged 40 lashes. Omar said, it's not affecting them. We'll make it 80. So if it were a prescribed punishment, Omar would not have, may Allah be pleased with him, changed it because this was from Allah or this was the instruction of the Prophet ﷺ. And in the hadith, 40 was not prescribed as 40. A man who was drunk would have been brought forward and people would hit him, whether with their clothes or with their sandals or with the branches of trees, regardless. So the most authentic opinion, it is not prescribed punishment. It's just a punishment up to the ruler to decide how many. The minimum is 40 and the maximum can go as much as he thinks it would be suitable, which is nowadays 80 lashes. Now, in the hadith, we learn that it is Allah who has drawn these lines, which means that it's only Allah who mandates, it's only Allah who prohibits, and it's only Allah who orders us to do what he wants us to do. We have a short break. Stay tuned, and inshallah, we'll be right back. Allahu, Allahu, ya Rabbi, ya Allahu, Allahu, ya Rabbi, ya Allah. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. So in the hadith of Abu Thalaba, may Allah be pleased with him, the Prophet tells us that Allah has drawn lines you should not cross, which means that only Allah can obligate things and only Allah can forbid things. It is not man-made. This law is from Allah the Almighty. It is not for us to come and say, yes, you should do this and you should not do this, unless it is based on the Quran and on the Sunnah. And when the Prophet tells us that Allah has drawn lines and we should not cross it, this means that we must not go into extremes. We should not innovate. We should not make things up in Islam that Allah Azza wa Jal did not tell us about. For example, there were three of the Prophet's companions, may Allah be pleased with them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they went to the houses of the Prophet to meet their mothers, the mothers of the believers. So they asked Aisha, they asked Umm Salama, they asked Hafsa, they asked Safiya, they asked Maymuna, they asked Juwairiya, they asked Zainab, all the Mothers of the believers, 
How is the Prophet ﷺ when he enters the house? Describe his daily routine. So they described it. He prays and he sleeps. He fasts until we say that he never breaks his fast. And he breaks his fast until we say that he never fasts. So he's like this. These three men told one another that, oh, yeah, this is the Prophet of Allah Alaihi Allah forgave all of his previous and upcoming sins. So he doesn't have to work a lot. But for us, we're normal people. Allah would hold us accountable for whatever wrong things we do. Therefore, I pledge for myself that I will never sleep at night. I will keep on praying the whole night, night prayer. The second one said, I pledge that I will never break my fast. Every single day, I will fast it throughout the whole year until I die. The third one said that I will never marry women. I will be like a monk, never marry women in my life, though I have the desire to marry a woman. When the Prophet heard about this, والسلام, he was angered by it. And he came to the pulpit and praised Allah, offered salutation to the Prophet والسلام, and said, why do I hear people saying so and so? By Allah, I sleep and I pray. I fast and I break my fast. And I marry women. Whoever chooses a sunnah, a way, different than my sunnah, than my way, he is not from me and he is not from among us. Meaning that Allah has drawn the lines. Allah has prescribed to us the do's and the don'ts. So there is no need for you to come and innovate or invent or bring up something that is not part of the religion. And if you do so, you are doomed because you're opposing Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah tells us that today I have completed my favor, perfected my religion and accepted Islam to be your religion. And you come and say, yes, but there's something missing. I'm going to add this and that. I'm going to innovate this and that. Yes, I know the Prophet did not do it, his companions did not do it. But I believe that this is good. And such a way of crossing the lines would make this person exposed to Allah's punishment and to Allah's wrath. Then the Prophet ﷺ told us that Allah has prohibited things, so do not violate them. Allah told us that this and that are prohibited, are forbidden for you to do. So you must not violate it. You must not fall into it. And we know that sins are divided into two types, major and minor. And so many times people come and say, what are the major sins? Are they seven? Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, was asked the same question. He said, they are closer to 70 than seven. And some scholars wrote a book and he called it the major sins. There are major sins and there are minor sins. What are the major sins? The best definition of major sins is that it is any sin that Allah Azza wa Jal has set a prescribed punishment in this life or cursed those who do it or told us that they will go into hellfire. So by this default, any sin that Allah has set a prescribed punishment killing, adultery, consuming intoxicants, stealing, slandering, all of these are prescribed punishments. They are major sins. But there are major sins that we don't have a prescribed punishment for, such as being disrespectful to your parents. We don't have any prescribed punishment in this life. The greatest punishment is in hell on the day of judgment, and we know that being disrespectful and disobedient to your parent is one of the major, one of the greatest and heaviest sins in Islam. So these are the major sins. And if you fall in one of them, Allah will not forgive you until you repent. So if you repent and show Allah remorse, Allah will forgive this sin no matter how big or major it is. Even shirk, even associating others with Allah, which is the highest in gravity and seriousness, if you repent and show Allah remorse, Allah will forgive it and erase it as if it was never there. And then we have the minor sins, which are anything that is forbidden other than the criteria that we've described, the major sins, 
with these minor sins become major sins if you continuously do with them without repenting or without feeling that they should not be done. And the minor sins, Allah forgives them when you pray. So from a prayer to a prayer, Allah forgives the minor sins in between, from Umrah to Umrah, from Hajj to Hajj, from Ramadan to Ramadan. So continuous good deeds help erase the minor sins. And also avoiding major sins. So if you do not backbite, if you do not lie, if you do not fornicate, if you do not do major sins, Allah would erase the minor sins as a reward for you. Then the Prophet went والسلام, to the last part, which is things that Allah did not tell us about. Allah was silent about. And the Prophet said, silent, which means that speaking is one of the attributes of Allah related to his action. So we have action-related attributes and we have character-related attributes, attributes related to Allah himself. So Allah is all-hearing, Allah all-seeing. But there are attributes related to Allah's actions that Allah does them when he wishes and he refrains from doing them when he wishes, like descending to the lower heaven. This happens every night. These are actions of Allah When he wants to do it, he wants to do it. Like speaking, like becoming happy, like being angry. These are Allah's actions. Whenever he wants to do them, he does them. So talking and speaking is an attribute of Allah. And that is why the Quran was spoken by Allah Azza wa Jal. It's his attribute. It was not created. The letters and the words are Allah's words. And whenever Allah wants to become silent, this is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his choice. So there are things that Allah Azza wa Jal did not elaborate, did not tell us about. And we should not go into details and research them. And this is specifically at the time of the Prophet Because if we research and we keep on asking, then we may burden the whole ummah when we ask about something Allah did not tell us about. And why didn't Allah tell us about it? Was it because Allah forgot? Astaghfirullah. The Prophet tells us that Allah does not forget. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا كَانَ رَبُّكَ نَسِيَ Allah does never forget. So why didn't Allah tell us about it? Because it's Allah's mercy and compassion for us. He did not say anything about it. And I'll give you an example. Hair on our bodies. We have hair that we are mandated. It's obligatory for us to remove. Men and women. And that is the armpit hair and the pubic hair. It's mandatory. And there is hair that is forbidden for us to remove, such as the beard for the men and the eyebrows for both men and women. It's prohibited to touch or to move. And there is hair on the rest of our bodies that Allah did not mention anything and the Prophet did not tell us anything about, such as the hair on the hands and the legs. So sisters call, can we remove this? We heard that this is changing Allah's creation. And the answer is no. It is permissible for you to remove if you wish to remove it because it's permissible. Allah and the Prophet ﷺ, they were told that this is mandatory to remove and this is forbidden to remove. The rest is up to you. And Allah did not forget. But this is of His compassion and His mercy, the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we should not research something that was not meant to be. We have the halal clear, haram is clear, and doubtful matters in between. As long as it's not doubtful, and Allah did not mention it, it means that it is halal. Go ahead. Except when it comes in forms of worship. Everything you see around you is halal, as long as it's not specified otherwise. But when it comes to forms of worship, when one says, I'd like to introduce this form of worship, it becomes a bid'ah. So you are not allowed to do this. And Allah, the Almighty, does not forget Subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything is recorded and he knows every single thing. But sometimes you may read in the Quran, they forgot Allah, so Allah forgot them. This does not mean that Allah forgets in the sense that Allah is unaware. No, it means that because they've neglected Allah, they did not do what Allah told them to do and they were heedless about it. 
Allah the Almighty neglected them and left them on their own and he would not subhanahu wa ta'ala give his mercy and compassion to them. This is all the time we have until we meet next time fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah, Allah, ya Rabbi, ya Allah, Allah, ya Rabbi, ya Allah. Muhammadun Rasulullah Muhammadun Rasulullah